Awesome. So to get the webinar started, let's have um, Bettina to do the karaoke. And it's amazing to see three of us, uh, Bettina, Christina, and I, uh, in the same portfolio in this webinar. So Bettina, over mm. to you to do the karaoke. Yora, um, faya te mataranga kia marama, kia faitake namahi katoa, tu maya tu kaha, awa atu, awa mai, tatu i a tatu katoa. Seek knowledge for understanding, have purpose in all that you do, stand tall, be strong, let us show respect for each other. And thank you, Kwong Noi, over to you. Thank you, Bettina. And um, so today we have Diane from University of uh, Waikato to be here with us today. So, so good to have you today, Diane. Uh, thanks for making yourself available and to come to talk to us in for this very exciting and very important topic, uh, very timely topic as well. So I have known Diane for a few years now, so I, but I haven't seen you in person for a while. Um, <laughs> so we'll hopefully to see you in person soon. Um, so Diane's... Um, topic today has been published in our Flans um, journal, um, uh, JOFDL, um, Journal of Flexible and Distance Learning. So talking about her experience on online teaching and learning for more than 20 years. Um, and I don't think that represents her age. Um, so that's okay. <laughs> So her talk, her focus will be um, emphasizing on the student engagement, asynchronous um, online discussion, um, student perspective, as well as teachers' workload. So over to you, Diane. Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, please go ahead. And I'll just pull up the slideshow. A few slides there. How's that looking? Is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Thank you. Tina Koto Kato. No kotirane te faka paparanga mai, ko Morrison Forbes toku papa, ko Isabel Bella Branston toku mama. I tai mai aku fano ki Aotearoa ite to ko tahi mano e iwaro o Nautiko Matoru ko Oriana te waka. I fano mai au ki Tamaki Makoto, i tipu ake au ki Oti Poti, e nuho ana au ki Kirikiri Roa. He kaiako au i te Farewananga o Waikato, ko tēnei taku mihi ki ngā tangata whenua o te rohi nei, ka mihi hoki au ki ngā tohu o Tainui. Ko Diane taku ingoa, nō reira tēnā tātou katoa. Um, I'm here to share um, some insights from um, a couple of decades of online teaching and learning, uh, but I'm going to keep it quite focused on the asynchronous online discussion um, area that was in the Joftal article. I'll explain why. Um, one of the reasons is because I did an earlier presentation back in February, um, which was one of the SOTEL um, trendsetter addresses, and I don't want to duplicate that one. It's a recording and it's linked to um, my, my profile, my staff profile for the University of Waikato, and I'll share a link to that at the end, but it's easily discoverable. So I'm going to talk about a few publications along the way, and they're all um, available in um, the research commons, um, a creative commons um, area at the University of Waikato or, or via my staff profile. And, um, and you can contact me anytime via my email address as well, which I'll also share. So today I want to focus on asynchronous online discussions. Uh, I want to look at student perspectives and talk a little bit about teacher workloads. And I was very pleased to see that my esteemed colleague, Stephen Bright, is with us today because he and I have talked a lot about teacher workloads over the past uh, years, and he has done some brilliant work on those that have co it's continued to influence me for a very long time. So I'm going to share some research insights and some practical suggestions, but more than anything, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we can have here to this afternoon uh, and to your viewpoints and your contexts, which may have some similarities and some differences to mine. This will be a familiar face to some of you, I'm sure. Um, this is my, my great and late colleague, Nola Campbell, who I worked with at the University of Waikato when I started here in 2002. 
Uh, at that point, I was coming from a role as a as a primary school teacher and an associate principal in an Auckland school. I had uh, just finished my master's degree and had never taken a single online class ever, either as a student or as a teacher. But at the job interview, I expressed an interest in the online learning that Waikato was doing at the time. And as a result, I was very, very lucky um, that Nola took me under her wing, involved me uh, in her classes, and I had the opportunity to co-teach with her for two or three years before she unfortunately passed away in 2005. Um, the co-teaching was such an incredibly formative experience for me. Um, she was fantastic at balancing support with challenge. She would often show me how to do something and then say, right, it's your turn to do it next time. And um, so it was very much an apprenticeship um, and a mentor ex mentoring experience and is one that I've actually reflected on a lot and I have written about it too. Um, it has influenced me in terms of my thinking about how people learn to teach online and um, about how we can support the professional learning and development of colleagues and of ourselves in terms of online teaching too. Um, from those very early days in 2002, I very quickly developed a, a, quite a serious addiction to online teaching and in particular to asynchronous online discussion. So I'd be in these um, discussion forums in this um, tool that we used at the time, which was a, um, it was called Class Forum, and it was Waikato's um, precursor to Moodle. Um, Waikato shifted to Moodle in uh, 2008, I think it was. So for that first six or seven years, we were using something called Class Forum. Now, I was so into the online discussions with NOLA, with other colleagues, and in classes on my own with um, groups of students. And I would find myself thinking, how can I make this discussion better? And then I'd be away from the computer and, you know, walking in the sunshine, thinking about the online discussion. <laughs> and so it, that's how I've determined that it was absolutely an addiction from the early days. But what I learned from NOLA is that it's the pedagogy that matters and that there's no point reaching for the tools and technology just for the sake of them alone, that she would call it ICT or EdTech. When is it a solution looking for a problem to solve? Instead, let's focus on the learning, quality learning and quality teaching at the heart of everything always. I also learned from NOLA that Teachers have to be learners too, uh, and that we don't know everything. And it's a huge relief to realize that. Uh, and that is one of the first things that I would say about teacher workload is let's share the load. And in particular, share it with students, share it with colleagues. And um, there are many of us around to help each other. Uh, I learned through um, Nola's approach to mentoring how to balance support with challenge, and I've tried to apply that to my work um, with colleagues and with students too, where the idea is that I should be there and be clear. So it, the, um, the two parts of presence and clarity are very important to me. I'll always be there to support students and colleagues as far as possible, but in turn will expect the very best and have high expectations of themselves as well as me. And I think that's part of a respect for people having high expectations. Um, Nola taught me about breaking down boundaries and about creating diverse communities online where in some of the classes that I teach I have students who are studying teacher education across early childhood, primary, secondary and tertiary education and um, they will be in the same class as students who are not studying to be teachers at all and who are perhaps interested in um, business, majoring in um, commerce, accounting, supply chain management, law, psychology. And um, in some classes, I've had up to um, 80, 90 students from five different countries across five different degrees. And that's what really makes for a wonderful, vibrant community. And in the long online discussion, they would be um, divided into smaller groups so that there was more cohesion and, and ease within the discussion. Finally, and very importantly, um, NOLA, right from the very early days, taught me about creativity 
and about having fun. I knew a few things about that from my years as a primary school teacher. Um, but in online discussions, NOLA taught me how to have a role play within an online discussion where we would assign roles to the students and challenge them, or where you could prompt an online discussion by using a scenario or a cartoon, rather than some of the stock standard approaches to stimulating, if that's the word, online discussion where people would say, here's a quote, discuss. Um, Nola was always creative and uh, I've I've learned a lot from her approach and have tried to maintain creativity in my own approaches too. Now, the stimulus for this particular um, presentation comes from this article, which was published in Joftal, um, which is Flans's journal, of course, last year in 2022. Um, the article, Student Expectations of Peers in Academic Asynchronous Online Discussion, came from um, some data that I'd had sitting around for a while. It wasn't particularly new or fresh, but it was something that I wanted to write as a different angle on um, an area I'd been exploring, researching and practicing in for a long time. And it turned out that this article um, was a fairly popular read for people. Um, it was the fourth at the time, the fourth most highly read article in Joftal of, two, of 2022, which was why um, people from Flans got in touch and said, hey, will you do a webinar about this? Because um, we're asking the authors of those popular journal articles to get in touch. Because I could talk for a long time about a whole lot of things, I'm going to try and limit myself as far as possible in the next um, few minutes to talking about this article, and um, maybe some of you will want to go and have a look at it. The key points of the article is that I did confine my focus in that particular publication to the undergraduate teacher education context. So I was reporting on an analysis of interviews and focus groups that I had conducted with student teachers in a primary education program. Um, I was focusing on a very low tech tool, the asynchronous online discussion, because I've learnt over the years that some of the most powerful tools can be those that are really not terribly new, um, not lots of um, bells and whistles, low tech, sustainable, tried and true. Um, and the focus of the article was on when students are asked to engage in asynchronous online discussion as part of a university paper in teacher education, what do they expect of their peers and how can the students be accountable to the class community and how can we prepare them for online discussion? Um, a couple of caveats about what I'm saying in the article. It's uh, Firstly, it's not a matter of me saying, well, here's what these students said, and so therefore this must be the case for everyone, this is the truth, um, but rather that it's an illustration of how consulting with students can inform pedagogy, and so we can all consult with the students that we work with in our own contexts. So that's a key message for me. Another one is that it's not a matter of finding out what students want and then making sure they get it and that you serve it all up to them on a silver platter. Um, and I'd prefer to distance myself from that sort of client or customer service mentality. Rather, it's about surfacing expectations so that these can be discussed and considered and understood and shared. And then so that actions can be negotiated and renegotiated as needed. So why asynchronous online discussion? Um, the research literature shows that there are several affordances as highlighted on that slide. And that um, although asynchronous Oh, synchronous communication, rather, like, such as we're doing now, um, the opportunities are technically far more accessible now than in the past. And we know that the use of Zoom very much um, dominated a lot of pandemic meetings and teaching and learning. 
I'm of the mind that there's still a need for participants um, to be able to have some flexibility where we don't always have to be um, in the same time zone as each other. And it can prove very, very um, challenging, as you will all know, um, to make it to synchronous events all the time. And increasingly, the students that we work with are juggling a range of um, demands on their time, uh, including uh, adult responsibilities of life and um, full-time jobs or even part-time jobs. And one thing I've always been pleased about is a, can you hear my dog barking? Yep. One thing I've always been very pleased about with um, asynchronous approaches is that the students I work with never have a timetable clash. So even though I do make some um, synchronous opportunities for meetings available, I have drop-in sessions, I've, I've got one tomorrow morning with students, I still maintain the asynchronous aspects so as to preserve these particular affordances. Having said that, however, we know that these are just affordances, where affordances are a potential in what we'd like to happen, what can happen, and what's the ideal. But I'm sure, like me, I might also have experienced um, times when discussion falls well short of potential, and where it's just plain boring, really, where you're talking about, that's me throwing dog treats across the room. It's a new strategy. Um, they can be flat uninspiring, bland, really tedious, pathologically polite, where people just say, oh, I agree with you and you and you, I agree with everyone. Or they can be incoherent. You can have a series of monologues or mini essays that's, that people write. And of course, they can be completely lacking in social cues. There can also be that situation where it's like crickets, just total silence. And in the online world, silence is absent. And we're all sitting there going, where are they? Where are you all? And I have posted that more than once myself in online discussion. So we know there's problems with asynchronous online discussion. It's not always an easy thing. But that doesn't mean that it's up to us as teachers to solve all the problems and that we have to come up with all the answers about how to improve the quality of online discussion. Rather, I think that to inform design and facilitation, it's sensible for us to consult students and to ask what do they expect of each other? As participants in asynchronous online discussion, what do they want from their collaborators in the online discussion, where the collaborator isn't just the te teacher or the technology, it's the group of students as a class community. So I didn't head right out and ask them those questions. Rather, I noticed that when I asked them what makes online discussion great and how does it help their learning, they came back with a lot of expectations that they had of their peers. And that's what I based this paper on. And this is a summary of what you can read in the Joftal article if you want to. Students basically said that they expected their peers to participate in a way that is relevant. They wanted to see people join in promptly and post regularly throughout an online discussion. They wanted their peers to share personal experience, but to avoid becoming fixated on that, instead to look beyond it too, so that the personal is just one representation of experience and being open to diverse perspectives is important. Students expected their peers to respond to them. Um, they didn't like to be ignored or to have their ideas repeated um, without acknowledgement. And I remember one very memorable student quote was, it's like they all just turned their backs on me and totally ignored what I'd said and then went on to take the conversation in a different direction or to repeat what I've already said. But I almost called the paper, they all just turned their backs on me. And I think a reviewer may have challenged that in an early iteration. Students like to be challenged, they say, in online discussion. They like to have their ideas built upon. Very importantly, they like to have their names used in online discussion so they know when people are responding to them. And they like... Um, posts to be succinct 
so they've got time to read them and so that it leaves space for new contributions and that other students avoid dominating a discussion by answering all the questions at once and saying absolutely everything there is to say in a very lengthy post. Um, students absolutely hate long posts and online discussion. So I've taken some of these ideas um, and I have turned them into a set of guidelines for online discussion. Um, those guidelines were picked up by um, student learning and used um, at our university. Um, I've examined them as part of my doctoral studies and I've um, published guidelines uh, in in a book that I'll, I'll share with you too. It's a, it's a freely available open source book. So what I do going forward is I try to make sure that the guidelines are very clear for students. I, I show them guidelines, I tell them about the guidelines, I give them exemplars of online discussion, models of online discussion, and I make videos um, with our Panopto software where I walk through expectations bit by bit. And then I negotiate with the students and ask them how they'd like to revise the guidelines along the way. Um, and I've run a few experiments typically where I would present a set of guidelines to students in a class at the beginning of a semester and then ask them to adjust those guidelines, retrial the second version of discussion guidelines, and then by the end of the class, they would evaluate the guidelines and create a new version, which would be passed forward to the subsequent class as a white paper to get them started on the same negotiate, revise route, because all of this is iterative and it's all negotiable. Um, students often need help with time management, so we often talk about that a lot in class in terms of me giving reminders about when to get into discussion, um, either individually or as, as a class, and in terms of students sharing tips for time management as well. Um, I've also learned thanks to Nola Campbell, to try and keep it fun. We have lots of fun in our online discussions with fun starters and also to give credit for online discussions. So I do provide um, grades for online discussions, especially for undergraduates, um, because of the need to give credit for work that is important and where a lot of learning is taking place and being demonstrated. So basically, this is a summary of um, some of my thinking and um, some of the things that have happened in online discussion uh, throughout the years where I've tried various approaches to promoting student leadership of online discussion and to negotiating guidelines, as I've explained. Um, there is a chapter in that edited book. Um, I co-edited co-edited it with Nolene Wright, and Stephen Bright also has a chapter in that book. Um, so that's a good one to look at, and it's freely available online. Just as Nola um, used role plays with students in online discussion, I've continued to do so. So I've played with the roles, but I assign roles to students in discussion and say, right, for the next 10-day discussion, this is the role you're going to play. Have fun with it, but it's an opportunity to try out some perspectives that don't come naturally to you and you have to go and research um, aspects that, um, that are new. Similarly, with a debate, um, I love to take a group of 10 students in online discussion and divide, divide them into two and say, you five are the um, affirmative team and you five are the negative team and you're going to argue the designated side of this particular proposal um, irrespective of what you actually think um, but then at the end I'll give them time to debrief over a couple of days and come back and say well here's what I've learned from having to uh, research perspectives that I didn't initially agree with um, in order to argue um, in this way and then they can say what they really think. We've had guests in online discussion. Um, people from NetSafe uh, have been wonderful guests. Um, the librarians uh, at uh, University of Waitag of Waikato make fantastic guests in online discussion. And um, probably one of the most memorable groups of guests I had were, was many years ago, I invited a, um, a class of um, year eights uh, 12 year olds into online discussion with my teacher education students and they were absolutely fantastic. 
Um, and I also worked with their teacher to publish about that experiment too. Um, currently, some of the favourite online discussions that my um, the students I work with say that they like the best is one where I ask them to teach a tool. So it's in a, a digital learning paper class where um, each student has to go and find a an app or a game or software or a new device and to play with it and to use the online discussion to teach their peers about it. Um, using video clips and tutorials, instructions, and, and so forth. Um, they say they like that very much, and it is, of course, an example of student leadership, as well as a, um, a good workload tactic for teachers, because coming back to the idea that we don't have to know everything, we don't have to know everything, we don't have to do everything, we don't have to find all the resources or have all the ideas or lead all of the discussion. And every time I open up opportunities for students to take leadership, they step up and do a fantastic job. And I always end up learning something new. So often when they are sharing readings and tools, I'll be following them up and commenting on them and preserving them to present to a later class as well. Um, there is also a, a plugin for Moodle that we've been using for collaborative um, reading activities and viewing activities called Perusal, and that's injected some fun and variety too into the discussion. So it follows that some of the realizations I've had over the past um, 21 or so years of teaching online are uh, that student perspectives really matter, whether those students are children, as they were when I was formerly a primary school teacher. Every time I tried to show or tell the 10-year-olds um, the I was working with how to do something with their computer, they would say, that's great, Miss Forbes, and they'd show me three other ways to do the same thing. I very quickly learned that student perspectives are important and that the students are perfectly capable of leading their learning and of contributing to the learning of others, including me. Um, while there are newer synchronous opportunities for online learning, I still maintain that asynchronous forums have a place because of the flexibility and the depth and the time to build knowledge. Um, I think that one thing that has helped me a lot with workload strategies has been being able to connect my research and teaching and service throughout each part of my role. And that, that really helps me to continue to feel inspired and to feel a sense of cohesion around my workload. I really, um, oops, sorry. I really believe that um, presence is important. So I'm constantly in the online classes, but often just browsing and exercising some wait time. And I contribute to every group roughly two to three times a week because that's what students have told me they expect from me. And I think it's obvious that I value students' perspectives and ideas um, and that um, I'm trying very hard to cater for diversity and to have um, student voice and student choice at the forefront of what I do. Um, assessment can be fun as well, and we could talk about that if you'd like to, so I'm happy to enlarge on any of these points as part of our discussion, but I would like to have a discussion. Um, I would love to hear about your contexts uh, and your stories. I'd love to hear from people who work beyond teacher education as well, because it's just one tiny little field. And I am interested in synchronous applications. If you are interested in any more of my work, um, this is a link to my profile, which has all my publications and so forth and presentations on it, um, in case there's anything more that you might be interested in. And that's my email address. Okay, thank you. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Diane. That was really interesting and insightful. Um, so any questions from the floor? I think there's one, um, Diane, um, from Bettina. Mm -hmm. Question to everyone. Um, well, I guess maybe you can lead um, the discussion on this about the grading. 
which component do you consider in the grad for contributing to online discussion and how do you measure the quality um, of online discussion or do you focus on grading in asynchronous online discussion? So would you, you'd like me to lead with an explanation of how I grade the discussion? Okay, it's actually very connected to what I was saying when um, I give guidelines for what is expected in online discussion, I then um, I, I grade what I've said I expect. So there are seven criteria, basically, uh, just from memory. One is that um, that the students are encouraged to participate in discussion somewhere around the beginning, the middle and the end, because that's always what makes a good story. And so I'm looking for, in a t I tend to design discussions to go across 10 days um, because that gives students a weekend. So if they start on a Monday, they don't close until the following Wednesday. And I do close them um, manually because I want, want students to move on. So I say in that 10 days, can you make a minimum of three contributions around the beginning, the middle and the end? But to keep the contributions succinct, um, we know from I know from my research that students prefer succinct, tight posts, so no more than 150 words at a time. If they've got more to say, they can come back later and say more. Um, I grade them on whether they have been responsive to others, to peers by name, um, and encourage them to be inclusive of people, um, to mention someone else in their group and to build on their ideas. And I also grade them on sharing personal experience, but being prepared to move beyond that with more depth and critique. Um, I grade them on using literature policy and theory in a way that doesn't involve verbatim quotes, but rather shows an engagement with, hey, I've found this and this is what I think about it, um, inserting hyperlinks or a brief citation, but I don't ask for full APA references in discussion. Um, I grade on depth and critique. And the final criteria is I grade on um, leadership. And so I suggest to them that some ways they can lead in the online discussion is by starting the discussion, being first into post, um, because I never first into post. I never go in until day two. Um, by asking each other questions in order to prompt thinking or by introducing a new thread with a different angle on the instruction. So the seven criteria there, um, I have actually published a version of those criteria in um, the Digital Smarts book. A similar version is used by student learning at the University of Waikato because it stemmed from my doctoral research um, uh, I did that, developed those criteria in 2008. And it's those criteria that we renegotiate in various forms with students. But that's how I grade it. How do other people grade it or not? That's, um, that's um, very interesting to hear that you put a lot of mechanisms in place, um, even though you call it guidelines. Because I have been thinking while listening to your presentation just now, one of the challenges I always face is how to start the ball rolling. So it's grading the kind of the way to force the students actually start the ball rolling or do teachers actually play a part in it? Both, really, I would say, um, from my point of view, having some fun in discussion and making sure the discussions are relevant to the learning intentions of the paper. So when I think about like one of my favourite papers is a digital learning paper um, for second year university students. We have discussions that ask the students to talk about their prior knowledge, what they know, um, and what they do with apps, games, software, and social media. Uh, we have a debate, as I've explained, which is actually about um, game-based learning. We have a um, role play, which is about internet safety. Um, and we have a teacher tool, which is where they share something that they have recently learned about and, and use the opportunity to teach their group. And then we tend to have a, a recap and a reflection. Um, and all of the work in the discussions is fun and interesting or can be. I'm always in the discussion trying to um, move it along, but also encouraging the students to do likewise. 
all of it is graded, so they're getting credit for it. Um, and uh, there was another point I was going to say. Oh, it's all related to the other assignments. So they are better prepared for the other assessments in the paper if they participated in the discussion. It's not um, foolproof. There are still students who who um, neglect the discussion and who, who don't participate um, in any great way. It just tends to be reflected in their grades. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's a good way of uh, making sure that, like, things are in place. Um, when you talk about grading, um, how does it line, align with the university assessment guidelines or policy? Because I know quite a few universities, um, they when they mention about discussion and then they say, if we grade the discussion, we should have a rubric because then how are we going to determine whether that is a quality way of responding? If someone say, I agree with this, um, I really like his or her discussion, um, does that count as part of the discussion? I do have a rubric. Um, I've based it on the seven criteria that I use, um, and it fits well with the University of Waikato's um, policies because I'm not just grading participation, um, grading based on those um, seven criteria. And if someone popped in and said, yes, I agree with you, they would get a minimal number of marks, perhaps by mentioning a, um, the, the name of a peer, but they would miss out on marks for the other criteria. So, so it tends to be fairly robust. Nice one. Thank you, Dai. Any question from the floor before I keep asking questions? I can talk about this topic forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone from the floor, any comments? Um, someone say, oh, from Katie. I often found my students were hesitating to start the discussion. Is there any strategy to encourage them? Yeah. From me, um, the, the strategy I think is first of all, I try to make the discussion starter interesting. So it's like, for instance, the debate idea is um, that there are lessons to be learned from online and digital games and gaming. And I'll put you into a negative group and you have to argue that games are terribly dangerous and there is nothing valuable of educational importance at all. Or I'll put you into the affirmative team and you have to argue for all the ways that people can learn um, through games. And then I'll remind you, it's starting and I'll challenge you to make your first post within the first two days of the discussion being open. And if it's a very early or it's a first year paper, I will go in individually and prompt people to make a start and say, notice I haven't seen you in discussion yet. Is everything OK? Um, and then by day two, I get into discussion and I start um, prompting and so forth. Um, and I tend to make Panopto videos where I will sit and go into the discussion as a, a screencast and will say, oh, I can see this person said this and here's a response and just try to invigorate it and not always in writing. Um, but at the end of the day, if the students um, are reticent about getting started or perhaps are really, really busy, we are limited to what we can do. We just have to explain the rationale for the discussion and the rationale for the discussions um, very much part of my guidance where I'm saying to them, look, you have a responsibility to yourself for your own learning to contribute to this discussion and you are going to get credit for it it will, and it will support your other work. But as well as that, you have a responsibility to the class community because if everyone avoids discussion, there won't be any discussion. And also that um, discussion is something that we learn about for later in our professional lives we it's some it's the way that we learn whether it's face to face or synchronously and so it, it is an important skill set to develop yeah no i definitely can see the role of teachers um to make this work and um that is quite important and significant um we have two hands up um i saw christina first so christina Thank you, Kong Doi. And thank you, Diane, for, for taking us through all your thinking, the guidelines, and giving us some ideas. And so just to your last point, I wanted to add, um, 
that what we had tried, especially when you have a longer time for a discussion like uh, 10 days, that we gave our students deadlines in between so that people didn't wait until the very last minute in order to post their forms because we, we wanted to encourage that conversation. So usually the deadline was a couple of days or three days before the final deadline to make their first post so that the others actually had a chance um, to meet or to respond by the end of the deadline. And that I found was very helpful to encourage conversations early on and ensure that everybody also did get a response from others. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Sweet, and Spice. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, and thanks for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, I guess my, my, my question here is your personal um, experiences in teaching and how to balance what your students want and expect and how you want how you expect instruct and because sometimes we, we do need to provide I guess guidance and work through with them to find what they want or what we want and you mentioned a few times so the students perspective their voices are critical yes um I would like to hear your experiences how you balance that how I balance um so sorry expectation and your expectation okay okay yep um, actually, discussion, I come back to discussion and negotiation a lot of the time. Um, the students tell me that I'm very clear about what I expect and why it's important. And also that if I state an expectation, like you are expected to contribute a minimum of three times during this 10 day discussion, roughly at the beginning, middle and end, then I'll do it as well. So um, I undertake that there's um, a reciprocity to um, to the expectations. Um, sometimes students will make suggestions either um, you know in in person individually or in the discussion or via the class rep, and I'll think, oh no, that's not going to work, and I'll just explain and tell them why. And other times, my first initial response will be, no, that's not going to work. And then I'll go away and I'll think about it and I'll say, actually, if we do this and this, it will work. So, again, it's about taking it seriously and um, negotiating with them. And um, they are very happy on the whole to know that there are certain expectations. We can be clear about them, but we can also negotiate um, for diverse needs and, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Spice. Uh, and we have one question on the chat from Simon um, asking how scalable this approach is and um, to what extent we need to change the approach with the class size. Well, um, there have been times where I've taught like last the last couple of years, last year and the year before I was carrying um, 29 Fs, which equated to teaching roughly 300 students across um, across my classes. Uh, I split them into groups of 14 rather than 10 and then I just carried on the way I always have. Um, and I so I think that after 21 years of teaching online and teaching up to 300 students that my practice is scalable um, and I still, make time for research and service and family and Netflix. And um, you know, I I don't I don't think it's um it's always easy. Um, there are times, for instance, when um students will want feedback on drafts of their work and will um ask for feedback and then uh if I haven't got to it within 12 hours, they'll upload another draft and ask me where I am. So I have to sometimes go back to expectations and explain to them that I can't work 24-7 on that alone. Um, but the way I dealt with that last week was we had a Zoom meeting, talked things through, and then I suggested that they look very carefully at the criteria and come back to me with specific questions rather than asking me to look at another draft of work. Um, and also suggested that they do some, some peer moderation of their work too. So yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's scalable. Um, it, it wouldn't be if I had thousands of students, but with hundreds, it's scalable. 
Yeah, I agree that teachers can't work 24-7 and I know that students always post discussions at different times as if they are living in the different time zone, you know, even yeah. though we are in the same country. So I think uh, Oriel made a good point here and say using student-led prompts so using the students' um, discussion point as a prompt for the next discussion so that it's kind of student-led. So it's not all relying on teachers, even though I believe teachers play a very significant role at different stages of discussions. I think um, absolutely, and as I say, I do um, expect and give credit to the students for taking leadership in the discussion and design the discussion for that to happen often, and also it's built into its, its criteria number seven. Um, but another point I would make about the workload management and the need to avoid working 24-7 is that um, it's a very unhealthy practice to model. Um, for younger people and that the majority of the students I work with online are teachers or are going to be teachers and if I show them that being a teacher means working like a slave um, then I'm doing them a grave disservice um, in terms of their future in the profession so it's really important I think that we don't um, communicate unrealistic expectations of work yeah, I know. Um, some teachers or some lecturers, they just can't resist, but then they feel like they are obliged to reply or say something. And then that actually gives the students an impression that um, it is not asynchronous. It is kind of becoming synchronous, which defeats the purpose, I suppose. So really good point, Kong Noe, it really is, because uh, firstly, if I reply to every single student right away, then I'm communicating that it's all about me and that only my response matters, whereas other students need time and space to respond. And in the primary school classroom, we call that wait time. Uh, it's really important that I don't dominate um, the discussion and I have time to sit back and watch. They know I'm there, but it doesn't mean that I'm making a noise in there all the time. Yeah, definitely. And we have one question here from Simon and said, do you ever have any frustration with the system um, limitation or um, do you have any wish list um, that if you could redesign your institution's BLE? Well, funnily enough, um, the, the people who, um, who are in charge of our... Um, our learning management system, uh, represented by the wonderful Stephen Bright, who's just posted three before me in there, which is it refers to when a student comments, they should wait for three other people to comment again, and that the lecturer should do likewise, so there aren't um, consecutive posts for people, and that's also one of the criteria I use. Um, Stephen represents our Centre for Tertiary Teaching and Learning, um, and they are incredibly consultative. So I know that we are looking to uh, looking for another upgrade in Moodle, our current learning management system, uh, in the coming months, and that I've been asked to put together um, a group of colleagues to play in the sandpit and try and break things. And and all, and I will be saying, hey, here's what I want, and here's what I don't and this is what's important to me one of the things that's important to me is being able to um, pull up forum posts so that I can easily grade them and um, I communicate that and I get it because um, the the Centre for Tertiary Teaching and Le Learning care about teachers experiences students experiences and um, successful learning and teaching and so I really couldn't want for a better group of people to work with and that means that and so far as I ever discover any limitations um, they will help me with workarounds or will help me to to push those limitations and make things better. They also suggest to me other ways and better ways that I can do things. They have this wonderful session um, every day, twice a day called Ask Me Anything. And so when I'm having an issue, I just jump on Zoom and um, they clear it up instantaneously. Yeah. Any last questions, comments? Time just flies when um, discussion goes on. Well done, Diane. I really love this discussion. Um, questions, feedback, comments before we wrap up? Any final remarks from you, Diane, before we wrap up? 
I'd love to hear of any any different experiences or anything if, if someone's got a point that they're they're dying to make. Hi, Dan, I'm Sandy. I'm from uh, the other end. We are from Melbourne, uh, not related to university, but to TAFE sector. So it's pretty interesting because always in my mind, the problem was when we teach as online teachers how to get students engaged. But I learned from what you said, having your presence in a, in also in balance and then facilitate their own learning because as adults, so I teach the people who are going to be future TAFE teachers. And when they have to become future TAFE teachers, obviously they come with lots of experience so to facilitate that uh, initial discussion, I think uh, the point you made where creating debates, I think I'm going to use definitely that point where, you know, have a little discussion around, okay, right, so there will be a content heavy uh, section of learning they have to do, but create it in, in a creative way that they can debate amongst themselves, where they can facilitate their own learning. I think that is the the takeaway that I took from you because it's slightly different from university uh, training because we are not uh, having anything graded. It's more like competency based, so they meet requirement or not meet requirement. But I think that will I'm definitely going to trial that to see how we, how we go with that uh, that kind of technique to create their own conversation and you know create the discussions among themselves. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Sandy. That's that's really interesting, and I think what you're describing is a um, a tertiary teaching and and a professional learning sort of context with with the TAFE teachers. Is that that's right? Yeah, they yeah. they become teachers to teach future uh, vocational learners. So, for example, plumbers or carpenters or nurses yeah. or whoever into a vocation, yeah. these teachers are the teachers who are going to get a qualification to teach those people. Right, that's excellent. And are you teaching them online and are they learning to teach online at all or will they be working primarily um, in face-to-face -face contexts with their the trades? So uh, I teach online, but they may become, uh, they can be either online teachers or face-to-face -face teachers. The reason I ask is because I just, um, I, I co-edited a book about continuing professional learning and development for online teachers um, last last year. Um, I'll just grab it. This, it's uh, this one. Oops, disappearing into the background. Do but it's called um, Developing Online Teaching in Higher Education, Global Perspectives on Continuing Professional Learning and Development. Um, so it's got 16 chapters from people around the world and um, it is it is um, held by our library. Uh, so you, I may be able to um, help you find a copy of it somewhere, but you can find the reference to it on my profile. And I completely agree with you that People come with such wide and and important, valuable prior knowledge, and really the, the point of discussion is to surface that so that they can learn from each other as, as well as from us, but we don't have to know everything. Thank you, Sandy. Awesome. That is a great sharing, Sandy. Um, so I think um, that left us with two minutes. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for participating in this conversation. And thank you so much, Diane, for taking time and making yourself available to um, present this very, very interesting and timely topic. So uh, lastly, we would like to have Christina to do the closing Kara care for us. Um, Kwang Nui, before I do that, do you want to talk about uh, briefly announce our next webinar that is coming up next month? Yes, so next month will be something quite exciting as well. So it will be a panel discussions between Flans and Escalite. So the exec on Flans and Escalite are joining together and I call them, I call the topic when the Wallabies meet with the Kiwis. Um, so <laughs> let's see how that goes. And uh, uh, it will be a very interesting conversation uh, again about um, online engagement, online discussions uh, for the following up with this topic and we haven't firmed out the topic and it will be advertised soon so watch the space people
And um, we will send a follow up with a link to the recording. And in there, you will also get the link to sign up for that webinar so that uh, you can easily see it. It will be at the end of next month. And yeah, so thank you also very much from my end as um, other com uh, finance committee member besides Kwong Nui and Bettina who had to leave for another meeting already for coming along to today's uh, session with Diane where we learned a bit um, how she works with uh, discussion forums in her long experience where she shared some stories and some really, really good insight into and, and ideas of what can be done in forum discussions to keep them alive, to make them interesting and to engage students as well as also using them for assessment purposes. So in order to let you now finish the session and get, get on with your day, to, um, embark on new adventures, our closing karakia. Kia whakaira te tapu, kia vatea e te ara, kia toro ki whakataha ai, kia toro ki whakataha ai, hōmie hōie tai ki e. Kia ora. <laughs>